Welcome to the next episode of HR Mavericks. I'm your host, Garrett Justice, and today I'm joined by a very special guest and friend, Joe Nabrotsky, who's the Managing Director at Global Leader Group. Joe, how are you doing today? So good. Excited to be here. Well, I'm super excited to have you. For those, many of you, most of you won't know this, but Joe and I actually go way back. We were friends and neighbors in Minnesota when we lived there years ago, right? Yeah, I tell people if Minnesota had a winter that wasn't so stinking cold, I would retire there. It's one of the best places we ever lived. We've lived all over the world, but the people, the six months of the year are fantastic there. So it was a good time. I say the same thing, but we better, hopefully we don't get too many listeners on this episode because I don't want them to know the secret, right? Because <laughs> Minnesota is one of those best kept secret places to live, I feel like. Exactly. It was hard to get people there, but once they were there, it was almost impossible to get them to leave. That's for sure. And look at us. Both of us have left now. It's unfortunate. But hey, Joe, tell us a little bit more about your career and what Global Leader Group does. Yeah, with pleasure. So I actually started off not being in HR. So I started off uh, as an entrepreneur. So it was earlier in my career and it was just me and three silent investors. And my wife was about eight months pregnant at the time. And for any woman out there, when you're eight months pregnant, you're thinking, you know, what do I really want? I want to move across the country away from my family while I'm pregnant and start a new company that doesn't even exist. So wasn't the the great, the the best husband experience that I did, but but she was extremely willing and, and excited to go. So we started the company. And after the first year or two, it was just me and three silent investors. And we started having success. Now we had the normal struggles that every new startup has, but once we had success, they came back and said, okay, Joe, I want you to grow it. And that's when we started hiring people. I started trying to lead. And even though I studied business management, I even majored in leadership, knowing and doing are very different Yeah. because I went from being responsible for the results that I could solely produce to now being responsible for the people who are responsible for those results. And leadership and HR, I honestly didn't even know what HR was at the time. And I just realized that I needed it. We weren't going to grow as fast or as good if I didn't have that expertise. So I started studying. I became a fanatic of anything around leadership and HR. And after several years, I saw the power of having that to the point where I decided, you know what, what if I would have had a leadership or HR coach next to me, we could have grown so much faster and better. So I actually changed careers. Mm -hmm. I decided to go back to school and get my MBA. So we took another two years went to Brigham Young University and got an MBA with an emphasis in HR and OD, and uh, then spent the, the next decade with a, a Fortune 100 company doing HR work. And you know, for anyone that's run your own company, you have to do everything from scratch. So after the MBA, I thought, I want to go and learn from kind of the best of the best, and then I can have a high bar that I can then grow. So I took pretty much every role in HR you can think of from a, a site HR generalist working at a plant so I got really deep into organizational development uh, for several years, and we would rotate around the different businesses of, of Honeywell, the $40 billion company. And then finally, the only business that I hadn't been a part of was the automotive uh, vehicle. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, just a quick timeout. Are we going to be able to edit some of this? Yeah, we'll just okay. so we can just back up a couple seconds and we'll just edit this piece out. And then the only business that I hadn't been a part of was the one that was in Switzerland. And so we always wanted to give our kids an international experience. So we actually spent the last five years in Switzerland in the French speaking part, which is right off of Lake Geneva and just had a fantastic time. In fact, while I was there, we spun off of Honeywell to become our own publicly traded uh, independent company. And so that was an incredible experience. And when I started doing that, you know, I spent my career as a leadership coach, really. That's what HR was for, for majority of the time. And that's where my passion was. And so it got to the point where that calling came so deep that I wanted to do basically what the the best of the best out there are doing from a Fortune 100 standpoint to the rest of the organizations. And so we started Global Leader Group. It's myself and there's 18 of us partners now. And very simply what we do is we help organizations find and build leaders. You know, think about the success of your organization. It starts with having the right people to lead it. And so we help you find those from a talent search perspective. So think of it as headhunting, uh, everything from the board roles all the way down to a senior manager position. 
And then on the build side, it's really leadership and learning. So we want to accelerate that belonging and performance of all the team members through learning and coaching. So we have different one-on-one or group coaching. We have, you know, for some, they don't really have a, a leadership framework. And so we help them with their leadership framework and get that up and going. So that's what we're yeah. doing. We're located really globally, but I'm currently now back in, in Utah. I love it. Well, I'm excited to dive into this topic today and just, you know, leverage that wealth of knowledge and experience you have at small to large companies in HR. One of the first questions I really like to ask a lot of our guests is, why did you choose to pursue a career in HR? You've already answered that question for us. So maybe just a little bit different is, why have you chosen to stay in the field of HR since you made that career transition? Yeah, so for me, I love business. I love everything about it. I love growing it. I love the, the what it's able to do for other people and, and how you can help a customer. But as I had that company myself, I realized the biggest things that kept me up at night, although it was so important that we had the right strategy and that we had the right technical expertise, whether it be sales or finance, the things that kept me up at night were pretty much all people related. Mm. How do I attract great talent? How do I keep them engaged? How do I help them to where it was big for me. I didn't want just somebody to come in and show up and do a great job at work. I wanted that impact to be when they went home. You know, I, I call it from the boardroom to the family room. How are they leading at home? How are they leading themselves to the results that they want? And so the, the impact that a great leader can have and the impact that focusing on the person that's behind that company, it changes everything, not just for the company, but it also changes families, it changes communities. And so I was just always passionate of realizing if you do the people thing right, the rest of the organization is going to be more successful. And so that was always kind of the focus. And so to have a career where that literally is what you're focusing on while still doing the business side has just been extremely fun. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, you know, I'm thinking back to what you said when you had that experience as an entrepreneur. And I know so many small business owners out there have to go through that transition where when it's just you or it's just a few of you, you're working, you know, you're working on your business and trying to really grow that business. And then it you get to a point where you have to switch, right? Where you have yeah. to you, you have to really work on growing your people who can then grow your business. And that, that can be a hard transition for a lot of small business owners, I know. So having that background and context, I, I definitely get it. It's, it's, um, it's very important. And I think one of the key things to help businesses be successful. Yeah. And what was interesting to me, and, and really as we set up Global Leader Group, which is our company now, is we wanted to have practitioners. And what I mean by that is people that have sat in the seat. I remember I went to some different trainings in the past and they were teaching about leadership or about running an HR organization. And I would ask them, okay, walk me through, like, what examples do you have? I'm like, well, actually, I've never really managed people or <laughs> I've never really led an organization. And, and then that's okay. And I realize there's a lot of theory that you can have a great understanding of theory and be able to transmit that through teaching. But for us, it was so important that we wanted people that actually sat in the seat yeah. that they're helping others to do. And so when I'm doing a training, for example, when I'm coaching an HR leader, I don't just say, hey, here's what the books say. I can say, here's what I did to establish our HR model. Here's what I did as a leader that was leading people in every major region. Here's how I did it in China versus India versus mm -hmm. South America. And I, I think that's an important piece too for every HR business partner or for every leader out there is to find people that really know what they've done and they've proven it so that they can then help you go through that curve faster. Yeah. I think that's such a great point is finding those mentors and people who can really, you can go to kind of your own personal board of directors, if you will, and bounce ideas off of them. You know, that's one of the reasons why we started this podcast is we wanted yeah. to kind of spread more of that knowledge between small business HR leaders. And, you know, to that point, I'm curious, based on your perspective of working as a small business owner and, you know, global multinational corporation in HR and now on the consulting side, what does world-class HR actually look like? What do, what do HR people actually do? Because I think that there's so many hats that HR people can wear, especially as, you know, in a small business where you might have a solo HR person or a small team, but, you know, according to you and based on your experience, tell us about what your definition of HR is. What does that look like? Yeah. Well, the good news is you're not alone in asking that question. In fact, I would say 
most business leaders, even for large companies, still have that question, wait, HR, what exactly do you guys do? Do you hire and fire? I've, I've watched The Office. I know what Toby does, but mm -hmm. what do you guys do? So uh, great question. I, I try to keep it very simple. Whether you're a small organization or whether you're a large one that has a very robust HR organization, HR focuses on three different things. First, people. Second, organizational health and third leadership. And so let me explain a little bit what I mean by that, but yeah. keep it very simple. People, organizational health, leadership. So when I say people, HR is really tasked with being the advocate for it and improving that end-to-end -end employee experience. And they do that by really influencing the people processes that are owned by the managers. And so that's the first and foremost. In fact, I like a lot of the organizations are starting to even go away from calling it human resources or even human capital management and start focusing on people experience mm -hmm. or I'm the, the head of people. And, and I like that concept because so much of it is that end to end people. And when I say end to end, it's think of it as from the second that somebody doesn't even know about or, or our organization, what's our em employee value proposition? How do we even get them to know about us and then attract them? And throughout that attraction, it's the whole hiring process. Mm -hmm. What do you do to make sure that you're vetting them and, and bringing them along that process? And then when they're here, how do you onboard them? How do you engage them, develop them, uh, maintain all the different things that need to happen, even from a compliance standpoint and all the other stuff? How do you reward them? What culture do you provide there? All the way up until retire. So whether you retire them or they move into another position or, or whatever it might be, HR is really running that end-to-end -end experience. And so I think that's the key thing is a great world-class HR knows what each of those categories means and can help it. So for example, one of the businesses that we're consulting with right now, it's a smaller organization. So they're about a $50 million a year. They've got three different HR leaders in their organization. And what they were trying to say is, I don't even know, like, what value do I bring to my business? What do I track? What do I talk about? What do I drive? And so knowing that end to end, we were able to start at the very beginning and say, okay, what are the biggest pain points? And let's focus on getting those short up. And for them, it was you know, workforce planning, meaning we don't even really know how many people we have, how many we should have. And so when it came time to hire, it was more of whatever manager was screaming the loudest that they had a need. And they really weren't matching it to the cost aspect of it or or is there other ways that they could structure the organization to be able to drive that? But that's just one example, but you can see that end yeah. to end. So the first one, people. Mm -hmm. The second one is organizational health. Now, this is one where I think most people don't focus on it. I, and I say this because me individually, as a, a former entrepreneur, I didn't really focus on this. I was so focused on more of the the specifics of finance, of strategy, of, of having the right pro, uh, products. Now, those are all important. I'll call those kind of the smart areas of business mm -hmm. where you've got to have that. And in most every company is smart with smart people. And one of the reasons why is because you study it in school. You can study finance in school. You can study marketing in school, and then you can apply it. But one of the areas where I feel like most organizations are weaker in is the organizational health. Mm -hmm. And when I say health, it's things, it's the other kind of smart. And Patrick Lencioni does a great job, if you're not familiar with his work, fantastic in this Love area. Yeah. yeah. So good. In fact, when we go and consult with different companies, in most areas, we have to had to create our own content. In the areas that Patrick Lencioni does, like team, cohes cohesive teams, mm -hmm. uh, like organizational health, it's so good that we basically just partnered with him and we leverage a lot of his stuff. But it's things like our morale. Uh, how do I have high productivity? How do I make sure that I have low unwanted turnover, minimal confusion? So all of those things are around the organizational health. And, and we kind of so solidify them into four areas. It's deliberately create your culture, mm -hmm. develop more cohesive teams, conduct that ongoing system-wide alignment. You know, if you think about it, all organizations are perfectly designed and aligned to get the results they get. And so what we do is we help orchestrate that holistic alignment of the people with the processes, with the strategy. And then the fourth one is lead and manage change. And so if you can do those four things, you're going to have a healthy organization. And that's what HR is really there to do is, is to make sure we're looking at that. 
driving that, doing different interventions to be able to help the organization. And then the third, and I would even say probably the most important is leadership. Hmm. HR is making sure that we have people who can lead those first two categories, who can lead the people processes and who can lead the organizational health. So world-class HR is looking at all of those three different categories and constantly saying, okay, what is the strategy of the organization and how do I align the people using those three different pillars to be able to meet and exceed those objectives? I love that. I think that's so uh, tangible. I feel like I'm in a masterclass right now, just hearing you break it down like that. I think it makes it makes total sense as you break it down in each of those three categories. And I think it's really helpful to think through that for especially those you know small business leaders who are taking on the HR role, or if they're a solo HR person, it's important to think through that framework, I think, because it can help you realize, okay, where am I doing well and where do I need to improve, especially when you're wearing a lot of those hats, right? Yeah. And, and this is where I would say a lot of smaller organizations, and I know this firsthand, both when I did it myself and also when we're consulting, you know, tens of different organizations right now that are smaller, is a lot of times when it comes to HR, it's kind of like, okay, we know we need HR. Who here can do it? And they'll kind of look around and say, well, who likes people? Okay. Uh, we'll take you. You are a former administrative assistant. You're awesome. Let's mm-hmm. put you into HR or whatever it might be. And, th- and these are fantastic people. What I found though is unless they have a framework and an understanding, HR becomes very tactical, yeah. which is still necessary. Like tactical meaning, let's make sure we get payroll right, which if you don't get payroll right, it doesn't matter all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. You, you're not going to have a good organization because people aren't getting paid. It's things like compliance and And some of the hiring, they do a great job of the hiring. But what we're trying to shift people is to be that more strategic HR leader. Even if you didn't have an MBA or a master's in in OD or in HR, or that's organizational development, we can still help you with those three different pillars to have a more strategic lens of what you're doing. And and when we start coaching these HR leaders, they come back and say, my CEO is saying they're getting so much more value after my one-on-ones and my different team meetings, because I'm not just talking about tactical, yeah. I'm helping her think about her organization holistically. And, and she's seeing the results of what it does when we implement these different things. Oh man, this resonates with me so much on so many levels. This is one of the reasons why I joined Eddie just yeah. a couple months ago, because this is exactly what we're focused on. We talk about how there's so many accidental HR people out there who kind of fell into it. Some of them are the solo HR person who came from an HR background, but some of them, many of them are the accidental HR person. So how can we help empower that person to be more strategic, know what to do and help streamline their processes so they can be more strategic, help build the organization. It's, and that's what successful companies are doing today, right? That's the trend that exactly that you talked about. This change that successful small businesses are going through is they're seeing HR as not just a tactical, not just someone you can get to for to make sure we're compliant or make sure that people sign the appropriate documents once we hire them but it's it's a shift to really focusing on this employee experience and and there is a wealth of data out there that shows that when you can do that well it helps your company be that much more successful and healthy across all aspects revenue more satisfied customers it's easier to find and hire the right people so i i i get what you're saying it resonates with me for sure And the good news with you all is you have Travis and you and and others of your leadership team that said, we see the value in this. And so we are going to spend time. It sounds so soft and fluffy to say, we're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about team cohesiveness. But if you get to the nuts and bolts of why organizations succeed, that's the type of of stuff that's really going to be impactful. So I loved hearing, you know, one of the first things that you did, I remember is you started getting the team together and saying, okay, what is our culture? What do we want it to be? Yeah. How do we shape this deliberately? We help people a lot of times go from the unconscious manager to the deliberate leader. Yeah. Uh, same thing for me as a dad. I, I want to go from the unconscious parent to a deliberate dad. You know, you come home from from work, and and sometimes you gave your best at the office, and you come home, and instead of influencing through listening and and all the great stuff that we learn at work, you kind of go to that control and hey, do this because I said so. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the power of a great HR and great leadership in a company is it's more than just helping them at work. It transforms their life. Yeah. And, and I've had so many 
CEOs and, and, and big presidents and vice presidents that I've coached that come back to me and say, I love the results you got for me at my work. It's awesome. But even more so, I have a better marriage. I ha- I'm a better father, a better mother, whatever it might be. That to me is true leadership. And I think that's what gets us so excited. Those that are in the HR and the, the people experience realm. Yeah, you can have an impact on so many lives, right? Through building a really healthy organization. That's core to kind of how we see the world as our, our company and, and why we really exist. So that, that definitely resonates with me. So um, I, I, I want to make one more comment just on this topic. I know that we're spending a little more time on this, but that's okay. I think this is great. You know, I think for a lot of small business leaders who are out there, they're, they're trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to get employees paid. When they hear about things like employee experience or culture and how important that is, they say, yeah, but I just want to get my people paid, right? I think I, I really like the concept of you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you remember back to school, right, applied to business. And that's something that I've I've looked a lot into recently. There's some really good you know articles out there about that, but it's true. And I think a lot of small businesses think about you know culture and all of that other stuff is great, but it's at the top of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid, right? I'm really focused on how do I get my people paid? How do I even find the right people and hire them? So I think it's important to remember that like there's an evolution that happens as a business continues to grow. It doesn't mean you have to wait for that stuff, but there might be some higher priority needs. And that's when you you probably get to a point where you find someone who can help you, whether it's, you know, a consultant, whether it's software, whether it's your individual board of directors who can help really get that bottom of the pyramid stuff tightened up, that process streamlined so that you have more time to invest in the strategic HR stuff. Is that right? Yeah, I love that concept. And and I'll give a quick tip to anyone that's in HR on this call. A lot of times, one of the bad rap that HR gets is we kind of come into those meetings and we think with only our HR hat. And so there's, there's something that's rolling out whether it's a new performance review process or a new policy or whatever it might be. And we go into with our business leaders and we just think with our HR lens and they come in and they say, look, you you can't even talk my language. You don't know what problems I'm facing. I'll do that another time when I have time. The biggest tip I can give to HR is when you're sitting down with your business leader is to find out what are his or her biggest problems. What keeps them up at night? What are their pain points? That's how I start almost every meeting with, with my different leaders, especially when I was an HR executive. I would sit down with, with the vice president or the president and say, okay, where are your pain points? And what I found is almost every single time, a majority of those fit into those three pillars that I talked about with HR. And so instead of me coming and saying, here's my HR agenda of what I'm going to do, it was, here's your number one problem. Let's get a team together and I'm going to help you. I'm going to lead you through a process to solve that. Yeah. And then once you solve that problem, they come back and say, wow, okay, I no longer have that problem. Here's my next problem. And you get to the point where I had my leaders that would come to me on almost every situation, whether it was, you know, I, I supported the CFO of Honeywell. So here's this, this individual that has this huge amount of different things that he needs to accomplish. And he would call me up daily and we would constantly meet up. Hey, here's what I got to do. I want to make sure I have that thought partner so that we are thinking about this the right way. And so that's the way to gain credibility is find out where they're at. And it, to your point on the, the hygiene factors, if it's payroll, that's an issue. If it's some of those other different things, I'm going to first start there. If that's mm-hmm. where your need is. And then once we start relieving these pain points, you can then kind of move up. And I would say for the larger companies, HR still is kind of a cost cutting machine. Um, we spend a lot of our time figuring out how to restructure and that, and a lot of them are wanting to get back to, yes, you still got to meet that need, but how do you still do all those other strategic elements of the team development leadership and, and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. This is such a great conversation. I'm, I'm learning so much from this. So, you know, I want to, I want to transition a little bit, um, our, our conversation a little bit, because you and I had talked about, you know, when we talked about what do we what do we talk about on this episode, right? You kind of pose this idea of I think a lot of companies, most companies out there are are facing you know employee burnout, where with all of the craziness that the world has faced in the last eighteen months or so, right? It's impacted so many people's lives and so many businesses, and there's a lot of employees that now are 
just lacking some energy. So from an HR perspective or from a business leader perspective, as employees are starting to return back to the office, how do you, you know, really engage those employees? How do you get their energy up and reduce stress or burnout? Because, you know, we hear it in the news all the time of how burnt out employees are. So I'm, I, I know that this is something that's really top of mind for a lot of business leaders, for a lot of HR leaders out there. So tell me a little bit more about how you think about that challenge and how HR and business leaders can and should address that as you know we continue to hopefully get back to this new normal that we're in. Yeah, this is a perfect example of what I was just talking about, of find what your business leaders have a need and solve it. So this is on the top of their mind. And so as HR, you're going to be able to, to come in and help. So first, of all, let me give some context. Uh, one of our friends is a professor that studies resignations at Texas A&M. His name is Anthony Klotz. And what he was finding is his premise was in 2020, we saw 6 million fewer resignations than normal. Hmm. So you match that with a lot of what happened during COVID, where we were doing soul searching. You yeah. had people that were really thinking, what really matters to me? What are my values? Are they aligned to what my company is doing? Do I want to stay here? Do I not? And a lot of them were waiting until things got a little bit better before they resigned. Uh, and so he labeled it as the great resignation. Hmm. And you all are hearing this probably on, on LinkedIn and other different things. Uh, but Anthony Klotz started this concept. And so what we're working with Anthony and other thought leaders right now is, okay, so we have this understanding of what's about to happen. What do we do about it? Yeah. What's kind of the next step? Uh, and so I'll give you a few different things, but, but before I do, let me give you a little bit more data just to, to give you yeah. some context. So if you look at in 2018, 18% or one in five different employees almost suffered from severe anxiety. So this was anxiety to the point where they would say it was impacting my work. Hmm. And then in 2020, just a few years later, that number jumped up to 30%. Wow. And when we surveyed those that are in their 20s to early 30s, it was more like 42%. Wow. And if you want to talk to millennials and Gen Z, 75% of millennials and Gen Z, they said that they have left a job due to mental health issues. Hmm. So you have this concept of, I love in the news and media, you're starting to see some sports stars and other people, uh, business leaders start talking about mental and emotional wellness in, in the office. And I love that because it impacts all of us to some extent. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, I, I don't have a big mental uh, issue or, or different things. Do you have stress? Do you have burnout? Do you sometimes have anxiety? And, and there's a scale. For some people, it's hard to get out of it. I remember we had some of our big leaders who would call me up and say, honestly, Joe, I had a board meeting and I couldn't even get out of bed this morning. Hmm. Now, the fact that they're able to even talk to me about it is a win because we're starting to have that change and shift into where in the past, it was almost like a, don't you dare say that you're not going to get the promotion. You're not going to get the raise. You're, you're now, you know, we're afraid of what you're going to do if you have these different mental and emotional issues. But the reality is all of us to some extent, Yeah. Uh, they did a recent poll and two thirds said that they didn't feel comfortable talking about their mental health with their boss. Hmm. So I, I frame that in, and that's just one aspect of many different that are going into this re great resignation. But, but what's happening is now you combine them changing, now having to go back to the office for some. And it's scary. You had some that were afraid for the health. You have many people whose family members, who friends were impacted by COVID. And, and think about it, in a matter of months, they went from being healthy to, to some of them even passing away. Yeah, that's the reality. So you have these people that are saying health is now way more prioritized. It's on the top of my mind. And now you want me to go back to the office and some are saying, great, I'm so excited to be around people again. I want to do it. And some are saying, I want flexibility. I'm realizing I can do my job and still have better work life harmony by working from home. Uh, can I continue? And, and you have this concept of people saying, well, no, you must come in or you have flexibility. So let me give you just two different uh, tips, yeah. very simple tips that you can do as you're kind of working this process of getting people to come back. The first one is to bring awareness to unconscious anxiety and provide tools to address it. So let me start. What do I mean by unconscious anxiety? This is something that 
that we at Global Leader Group have been talking a lot about is it's this underlying feeling of une uneasiness or worry, or anxiousness, without being fully aware of the source. Hmm. So I'll give you an example. The first time I had to travel again, I was going to the airport. And the first thing that you're thinking is, ah, you know, I, I got to get on there. Do I wear a mask? Do I not? And I wasn't really tapping into my, my feelings, but I was super anxious. Yeah. I was stressed and, and I didn't even fully know why until I was able to take a step back and be like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling anxiety. I'm feeling stressed out. I, I haven't done this before. I haven't done this in a year where I'm on a plane and, and where I'm around people. The same thing's going on when people are going back to the office. Right. They have this anxiety feeling that they're somewhat unconscious to. They just know something doesn't feel right. And so the first thing is bringing awareness to it to say, that's okay. You're human. We're all human. And as part of this human experience, we have these different emotions and feelings. And, and the, the worst thing that you can do is to try to resist or distract yourself from them because that only intensifies them. And so instead, you want to acknowledge them, embrace them, learn how to process them. And so if you have someone that you can talk to and someone that you can understand and say, it's okay to have concerns, it's okay to have some of those different dialogues. Uh, that would be the first thing. And then when I say provide tools to address it is, I mentioned it earlier, I see a huge shift happening for organizations, especially in HR. We did a great job addressing the physical health of employees. Now, partly because there was a financial benefit to it also, let's just state the reality. You have lower health care costs um, for an organization that's healthier. Yep. And so there was a financial benefit to say, we're going to help you become healthier and we're going to focus on that. We're going to do programs. We're going to give incentives, you name it. I see a, a, a transition where on top of physical health, which is all very important, we're going to add on mental and emotional health. You know, how are you feeling? What actions are you taking? A, a lot of people call it emotional intelligence or EQ for short, emotional quotient. It's the idea of I can understand and process my own emotions and, and control my own behaviors. And then for other people, I can understand and see and have compassion and build better connections because I understand what they're feeling and what they're going through. I think with them, I feel with them. And then because of that, I act to help them. And so I, I see this shift of, of companies saying, look, in the past, we didn't touch that. Um, we didn't really talk about it, much less give tools. We're seeing companies approach us and say, hey, can you actually do trainings? Can you do coaching? Can you help our people when they're feeling stress or anxiety? And, and remember, I, I was an HR executive with senior leaders. So I would talk to people before they had their town hall in front of thousands of people. I would talk to them before they had a board meeting. And, and to say that they didn't have anxiety or stress or other different things is just incorrect. Yeah. A lot of times they didn't want to talk about it, but they were there. And so if you can, can provide some tools on how do you process emotions? How do you become more aware? How do you talk about it? Uh, that would be the first thing. The second thing is, and this is gonna be going back to what I said on the pillars of what HR does, is we lead and manage change. More importantly, we help the organization build that capacity and capability to lead and manage change. And so I think more than anything is to have a actively manage and lead the change process. So if any organization is thinking this is a small deal, to have people come back to the office, you are inc incorrect. Yeah. For some people, it might be a small deal, but for the majority, even if they don't realize it, remember that unconscious anxiety, it's a huge transition from, from whatever it's going to be today to what you're going to go tomorrow. So the first thing is provide training and increase communication to help your team understand what's changing and what remains the same. That is a huge part of a lot of times the problem that we come into is we have mismanaged expectations. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be very clear. Hey, this is not changing. This part is changing. And for those areas that you're still figuring out, like companies are still deciding, are we going to say you have to come back? Are we going to say you have to be virtual or there's a hybrid mm -hmm. and they're developing the policies and, and how do we communicate it? And, and some are communicating it very well and others are actually having talent leave solely or I should say majorly because of how they're addressing this return to work policy and, and communications around it. And so that I'd be very clear that if you're still deciding that to be clear with them and say, Hey, look, we're going to 
we're going to test this out. Kind of like a startup has a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. This is a minimum viable policy. We're going to say for the next month, for the next three months, here's how we're going to work our hybrid work environment. And then after three months, we're going to readdress it. During this time, we want to hear from you what's working, what's not working. And then we'll revisit it in three months and decide where do we do next? And, and we might know at that point what we're going to do for the long haul. We might not. But just having that communication and saying, here's what we know and don't know, and setting the expectation that we'll revisit it provides them a little bit more comfort in knowing, okay, I can, I can go that next step until more comes. And uh, along with good change management, I would say have an employee platform uh, opportunity to give feedback and that the leaders just listen. Yeah. Just listen, hear what your employees are saying, find out what motivates them, find out beyond the office what they're going through. Uh, if they can do those different things, that will make a huge difference as they try to, to return to the office. I love those. I think those are great tips of just exactly where to start for, you know, a lot of small business leaders and HR people is just where do I start? That's the question. I don't know. And I think that the, the tips that you just pointed out are, are great, great places to start. And I, I completely agree that we are seeing this shift of more mental health and awareness and being, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy about that. Um, you know, one antidote for me on that is, you know, it's kind of interesting as you're talking about that, me thinking back of, we've published a couple of these episodes so far, right. And at, for this podcast. And when I, when I reach out to, you know, an HR leader like you, I ask them what's top of mind, what do you want to talk about? And that's kind of how we pick our topics, right? It's interesting to me that, um, already in just a handful that we have published, we've already had two that have been focused on this idea of mental health. I mean, I'm sure that there would be more because there's, there's just, it's top of mind for small business leaders, for HR people, because it's something that is a change that's happening in the workplace, regardless of what your work environment looks like. And I think that's a positive thing, but business leaders and HR leaders need to be prepared for that and know how to navigate through that change. Right. Completely agree. That's great. And to your point, um, I think to these points, you have actually been working on a new course on this topic, right? Uh, it's, it, forgive me if I get the title wrong, but it's something about managing your mind and your EQ. So your emotional yes. intelligence, is that right? Yeah, you nailed it. You got Tell it. us a little more about that. Yeah. So, so I mentioned a little bit about the mental and emotional health even though a lot of people are starting to say in companies and HR are starting to say, yeah, I see the need here. I see the benefit here. The next question they ask themselves is well, how? And a lot of times in the past, they would provide different programs that could help. Like, you know, I'll give you additional um, contact with, with someone that can help you from a financial standpoint or, or other wellness categories. And so what we wanted to say is you don't have to be physically sick to work on your physical health. Right? We see the benefit there. You don't have to wait until you're mentally or emotionally incapacitated mm -hmm. to realize there's a benefit in being aware of and working on your mental and emotional health. And so we're trying to help business leaders address that mental and emotional challenges that the employees face through the lens of how do you manage your mind and what we're calling the emotional intelligence, which uh, of course was started many years ago by other different uh, thought leaders around it, but it's that ability to identify and manage our own emotions and our own behaviors, and then be able to authentically connect with others. So let me start with what do I mean by manage your mind? Now, I want you to think about it. The results that we all have in our lives, they don't just happen to us. We co-created them. Everything we do, the results we create, they're caused by the beliefs within our brains. It starts with a thought, and then that then propels us to feel a certain way, that emotion propels us to take a certain action or not take action. And the actions that we take get our results. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is though, left unsupervised, this human brain that we have, although it can do so many great things, it will do the exact opposite of what's needed to get the results that we all want. So for example, it will actually avoid discomfort. It will avoid pain to help protect us. Well, think about what is change? What is growth? It requires that uncomfortable feeling of going beyond the past proven successes. And that's uncomfortable. 
It doesn't feel good to go through change. It doesn't feel good to, to take on a new job that's beyond your current ca capabilities because you want to be proven to have been efficient. And so our brain's trying to help us survive. But what we need to do is help it to help us thrive. And yeah. so what we do is we help people understand how does your brain work? What's the cognitive science behind it? And then how do I use that science to make sure that I'm having thoughts that are serving me and then to uncover the thoughts that are not and to focus on controlling what they can control. So a lot of the work that we do, it's, it's not just a training. I think the other big thing of what we're trying to do is change the game of how learning is done. It's not about content anymore. Even though content's important, you have content everywhere. You can get content for free on the internet. You, you can get content. Other, it's not about content. It's about experience. Mm -hmm. So how do I help people take knowledge and move it to changed behavior and improved results? And so as part of our courses, we, of course, give new information because remember, it starts with beliefs. If I can help people think differently, learn new concepts and then teach them other different things, it will translate into actions and results. But it goes beyond that to where we give them experiences, which includes coaching. So they learn a topic and then that next week they're actually implementing it. And then we, we group and we do group and individual coaching around what worked, what didn't. Just like a great coach can help you see things that maybe you can't see on your own, can challenge you, can help you grow. Uh, we have that as part of our process. And a lot of ours have a virtual social element where it's kind of, you, you know, you watch a short TikTok like video you learn a concept, you apply it, and you're commenting, and you get experience points by commenting, by having others comment on your post, and <laughs> it creates this community of learners that are growing together. And so we focus on really how do you manage your mind, which in turn is all about actions and everything else to where you don't have to change the external environment for you to feel better. You know, managing your mind changes everything without having to change everything. Yeah. And then the second part is emotional intelligence, where we teach them some of the basics around how do you become aware of what you're feeling? How do you process and even create emotions? That's the fun one. When you start talking to people, how do I create motivation? How do I create commitment? It's not external. You can actually create it internally. And so we, we empower and equip them to be able to do that. Love it. Sounds like an awesome, awesome course. If there are listeners out there who want to learn more about that, what's the best way for them to learn more about that course? Is it just to reach out to you? Yeah, reach out to me. You can go to the website. It's www.bethegloballeader.com. That's bethegloballeader.com. Uh, we're posting all the time on, on LinkedIn. So Joe Nebratsky is my name or, or Global Leader Group. Uh, we're going to be rolling out those courses. Right now, a lot of companies are doing it for their company, but we had so much demand from individuals that said, look, I want to work on this. Uh, and, and a lot of them are saying, my spouse, my spouse has not gotten any development from, from being a stay at home spouse. Mm -hmm. Can I have her or him attend this course? And so we're, we're opening it up to business leaders, spouses, um, and, and that way people can join and they don't just have to wait for a company to sponsor it, even though a lot of them are, yeah. they can join and join this community where we have a cohort that kicks off. And then every about month or two, we have a new cohort and it's a six week program. So it's super doable, 15 minutes a day or so. And then you'll start seeing the, the change behavior and improved results really quickly. It's, it's an amazing program. Love it. Love it. I cannot wait to see more about that. So that's awesome. So Joe, tell me about, um, you, you've been talking about this course that you're working on, Managing Your Mind. Do you have any examples of the impacts for businesses who have gone through that course and applied some of those principles. Yeah, you bet. I'll give one example. This is one of the leaders that, that's over at Google. And he initially approached uh, us and said, hey, look, I'm going through a tough time right now. I'm working with a boss that we don't see eye to eye. Uh, I'm trying to get promoted and they're not looking at me in the right way. Uh, they're promoting people that don't have the skill sets that I have. And he went on with all these different things and he said, at the end of the day, Joe, I'm feeling stuck, I'm frustrated, and I want to leave the organization. Hmm. And here's an, an incredible organization, right? And he had been with Apple and, and all these other different ones. And here he has this incredible job at Google. And he's saying, I just feel like I need to leave because it's not working out. Hmm. And so when he went through the manage your mind and EQ, the first thing that we teach them is to control what, we, what you can control. And so he thought the problem 
was his boss, the policies that HR was doing, uh, how other people were getting promoted. Notice how all of those are outside of his control. Mm -hmm. No wonder why he felt stuck and frustrated. And so what we helped him see is if he can learn how to manage his mind, which meant instead of looking at that situation and seeing all the negative and how terrible this is, it was the thoughts that he was thinking that was causing him to feel the emotions he felt, which caused him to take the actions he took and get the results he did. Mm -hmm. And when he could see that, he started realizing, well, look, I'm actually the one that's not showing up how I want to, because I'm not, when I get a call from my manager, because I'm thinking these thoughts so, so negatively about that person, I'm not answering the email. I'm not trying to help out beyond my normal scope. And he started seeing, look, I'm actually the one that's propelling this result that I don't want. And in just about four short weeks with him, we got to the point where he sent me like a three page uh, thank you letter of, look, I feel so much more in control. I feel better. I'm not having the anxiety and the stress that I have. I feel excited to actually stay here because I feel like I'm in control of becoming the type of leader that they'll want to promote. Yeah. All of this through being able to better understand what was going on in his own mind and take control of it and process his own emotions and take control of them. And, and so that's really the core of what we do. Whether a lot of times people will come and say, my problem is I have anxiety because I don't wanna return back to the office. I have a bad boss. I don't like the relationship with my employees, spouse, whatever it might be. And we can help them take control of what they can control. And through this course, I, I, one other person, Eliza, she's a, a manager of a $3 billion smaller company. And she said, this program has literally been life-changing. Um, and so when you hear that type of feedback, it gets yeah. me excited to be able to reach other people. I love it. It's so powerful. Thanks for sharing. Well, Joe, this has been an excellent conversation. I really appreciate you joining and sharing a lot of your insights, experience, and knowledge. You know, one of the last questions I have for you is one that I like to ask all of our guests because, you know, it's important. I think we, we, we hit on this a little bit at the beginning. You know, you were kind of talking about this and it was making me think about this last question I wanted to ask you, right? But um, here at Eddie, one of our core beliefs that's part of our vision is we really believe that building a healthy business is one of the most charitable things you can do if you do it the right way, because you have the ability to impact employees, customers, your community, and you know even down to outside of the work life, that home and personal life like you were talking about earlier. So with that context, in your opinion, what's the quote unquote right way to build a healthy business today? Yeah, great question. There's so many different concepts to this that I'll, I'll give you just a few. And, and honestly, it really comes back to those three pillars that I said of what HR does. This is not just HR's scope of, of responsibility. It's any business leader is the people experience, it's the organizational health, and it's the leading change. Uh, but more so what I would say is if you can start with your values, and I know sometimes values has a bad rep because people say, well, yeah, that's not tangible enough. I can't understand it. But, but if you can get very clear on what are the values that you have as an individual have, and then what are the values that you as an organization have? And in, in each time that you're part of leading a team, you're going to have a mixture of your own values, your, your company's values, and your, your team values of what you're trying to do. But I would say start there on being very clear on the critical three of what is important to us, because you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And if you can define what are those values that you're going to focus on, it provides clarity to the organization. When you go and hire someone, you're hiring for the right type of cultural fit. When you promote someone, you're looking at the, the correlation of the values that they have. And of course you have results and other things too, but you're, you're not losing fact on that culture element is so important. And so if you can have clear values that you then live, you know, all of us have a culture. The question is, is it a deliberate culture that you want? Mm -hmm. And so if you can provide that space where, where people can come and, and be part of something that they can align to, that would be the first thing. The second thing would be is to treat people as people. You know, so many times I think we as leaders, although we have good intentions, when you're now trying to drive results with and through other people, our natural tendency could be to kind of go into that power and authority mode where you almost see people as parts of a, a machine 
And if I can just change the cogs and if I do this, they'll help me get the results that I want. And if you realize, no, every single person in your organization has feelings, has desires, has worries, has joys and excitement that they're trying to, to fulfill in their life, to feel committed and fulfill themselves. And you start seeing them as a person, it changes the way you talk to them. It changes how you lead them. It changes how you reward and recognize them. And so I think that's the key is kind of look outside of yourself as cheesy as it sounds. Uh, but that servant leadership is truly the only type of leadership that works and to see them as a person. And, and, and then because they're a person, they have different thoughts and ideas. And so you're going to be more inclined to, to listen and to, to know, help them understand that they matter. And they're, they're the reason why this organization is going to be successful. Love it. I think those are awesome tips and I completely agree. If you can do that, you're going to build a, a healthy business that has impact on so many lives around you. So well, Joe, this has been, this has been awesome. Again, really, really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us today. Hope you have a great rest of the day. Hey, thank you so much, Garrett. Thank you, Eddie HR. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.